next speaker is Lawrence Roy from Oregon State University, and he did his practicum at the SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory. Thank you. Um, So my research is mainly focused on uh, secure two-party computation. So let's see what that is. So um, here we have Alice and Bob, the intrepid cryptographers. As always, they want to do something securely. In this case, they want to compute securely. So Alice has uh, an input x, and Bob has an input y. Together, they want to compute some function f of x, y without ever leaking to each other what x and y are. So they, they want to keep them secret from each other. But this, uh, so they run a two-party computation protocol, sending messages back and forth to, to do this. So applications of this are situations where you like, either just mistrust or due to re regulations, may, you may not be able to get all the um, data required for calculation owned by a single entity at once. Uh, so for machine learning, you may need to, uh, you, you want to get as big of a data set as you possibly can, but that you may not, people may not want to give it, just give you your data. Um, so I mentioned cryptographic assumptions. Uh, what, what are these? So the way cryptographic protocols are designed, they, um, you, you prove their security by saying, if I could break this, then there's a way I could transform that to break some other thing that we believe is already secure. So there's a couple different categories I make. make. Um, so symmetric key assumptions are like, uh, basically, they're just about mixing together data in a random, complicated way that is hard to attack. We know, know pretty well how to mix data together, and we can do it very rapidly. Public key assumptions, on the other hand, are a bit more difficult because they require mixing data while still um, preserving some structure, maybe like a group or something. Um, and so they often are more expensive to instantiate and harder to be sure they're secure. So I, I try to stick with symmetric key uh, assumptions whenever I can. Um, so there are three main techniques used for secure um, two-party computation. Uh, what they all have in common is they divide the function to uh, evaluate up into individual um, gates. That they divide into a circuit of gates. And each, um, all the inputs get encrypted somehow. Then they perform some um, cryptographic operations for each gate in order to um, turn encrypted inputs to encrypted outputs to eventually get the encrypted output of the final circuit, uh, which then they can decrypt. So secret sharing is the cheapest in terms of communication, sorry, computation. Um, it takes only like a few cycles per gate. Garbled circuits is like an order of magnitude higher, and fully homomorphic encryption is several order of magnitudes more inefficient than that. So it can get quite expensive. However, communication is often the, uh, a bigger worry with for this because um, so it's, I'm sure many of you have worked for like worked with um, HPC pro algorithms that are uh, communication bounded or memory bound bandwidth bounded, and you need to uh, you have to like come up with compression schemes or some something to make better, uh, more efficient use of your communication, even if it requires more computation. Well, this is more, even more true for um, uh, multi-party computation because the parties don't trust each other and like. Alice, why would she want to put her server in Bob's server farm if she doesn't trust Bob? Um, it was even more so for uh, latency of the communication, like if you're widely separated, now it takes many milliseconds to get a message from one place to another. Secret sharing has the downside of requiring a uh, number of rounds proportional to, so messages back and forth, proportional to the depth of the circuit, so like the amount of sequential operations you're doing. So if your algorithm isn't very parallelizable, that can take a a lot of just waiting for messages back and forth. Finally, there's the uh, cryptographic assumptions used. Neither garbled circuits nor secret sharing require any public key assumptions. That's probably why they're reasonably fast, um, except for they require some initial, some oblivious transfers, which are, uh, I'll get to that later, but they do require public key assumptions. So I will, I'm focusing on uh, garbled circuits. They are, I, I think, sort of a nice intermediate between these two extremes of secret sharing and FHE. Um, so to get an idea of what this um, applications can look like, there is a um, paper secure ML where they um, implemented two-party computation for a, uh, a neural network. They trained, they, they, uh, inside two-party computation, they trained a neural network on the MNIST data set, one of the smallest image recognition data sets. Um, they used a hybrid of the secret sharing and garbled circuits techniques. 
and they uh, uh, used two servers in the same um, data center, so there's very fast communication. Even if all those advantages, however, it still took 1.2 1, 1 hours to train, and this is just even just the online time. Um, and this was mostly due to having to evaluate the ReLU function inside uh, garbled circuits. Um, also, the off, there's, a, there's some offline pre-computation has to be done beforehand, and that was 80 hours. That's mostly doing a whole bunch of oblivious transfers. So as you can see, like, it, these things can get quite uh, costly. So how does garbled circuits work? Um, the, uh, so the, uh, Alice and Bob become, take on roles. They become the garbler and the evaluator. Um, the garbler uh, garbles their circuit. They mix it up somehow to uh, get a garbled circuit, capital F, and then they also uh, get the garbled inputs, capital X, to pass to the evaluator. And uh, what the garbled circuit looks like is just some encrypted lookup tables, um, mapping each encrypt for each like gate and mapping encrypted inputs to input encrypted outputs. Then they do some oblivious transfers. So the uh, evaluator puts in. Uh, Bob puts in his inputs Y and then learns the, um, uh, their garbled inputs to the circuit. Finally, the evaluator can evaluate the garbled circuit and then they put the, their outputs together to decode the result. So what is this oblivious transfer thing I've been jumping around for over? Well, uh, out, uh, the garbler needs to um, give these two, uh, so the, the evaluator needs to know the uh, input uh, wire labels. So the garbler knows encryption of zero and encryption of one. The garbler wants encryption of X, where X is their input. So the obvious transfer just gives them one of the two messages, but not the other, and does it privately. However, there's a, there's a variant of random obvious transfer, which turns out to be good enough um, and is more efficient. It just means that the inputs are sampled randomly rather than chosen. Um, so. Uh, so far, so good, but unfortunately, oblivious transfer requires public key encryption, as, as I said, and if you're doing a lot of them, you might need like millions of these things, you, um, it becomes very inefficient. So there's um, something called OT extension that can take lambda, lambda is the security parameter that controls how hard it is to attack, it's typically set to 128, um, and uh, you can take a lambda of, base, of these OTs called base OTs and turn them into as many oblivious transfers as you want. Um, putting all three of those together, um, the, you get a, um, a system, a very, um, a, wide, a fairly uh, commonly used system for um, secure two-party computation. So I'll give a little uh, summary of the um, work I've done to optimize this system. So the, uh, last year I discussed uh, three halves garbling, or uh, also called sliced and diced garbling, that um, is the optimization for the garbled circuit step. Uh, it achieved a 25% improvement in the communication complexity. Um, the downside is that it's 50% worse in the um, computation, but due to the, the way the, it's still heavily bottlenecked on communication, so that's not a problem. Uh, the sort of the idea behind it, the, the, um, the previous state of the art changed the way you hashed the inputs, you hashed like the previous encryptions and use the hash to get the lookup table to decrypt the output. Um, and the previous state of the art changed the way the hash evaluations to make it sort of redundant in a way that allows you to compress it. And that uh, compression then is what gives you the improvement. So we found a new way of uh, compressing it further based on slicing into two halves and operating on them separately that gave this 25% net speed up. Uh, next is uh, OT extension. So I was working on uh, yeah, uh, optimizing this OT extension uh, for, to get this soft-spoken OT. So the um, soft-spoken OT is similar to IKMP, which is the um, still commonly used OT extension that's uh, has come up from 2003. It's very uh, efficient for computation. It uses only a symmetric key assumption, a correlation robust hash. Um, but on the downside, it needs 128 um, bits for every OT of communication. Uh, more recently, there is a line of work called Silent OT that um, is based on some public key assumption, but can speed this up a lot by uh, making it only depend on the log of L, the number of OTs you want to generate. So the more OTs you generate, the faster it is for com communication. But the, it requires syndrome, uh, computing syndrome and linear code, which means solving a large sparse system of linear equations, which can be difficult to do quickly. So SOS OT is optimization of IKMP based on um, a communication uh, computation 
trade-off. So this uh, parameter k, you can go become k times better communication for any value of that k, but the downside is that it's two to the k divided by two k times more computation. So we uh, implemented uh, soft spoken OT, and um, you can see they as like the number of, if k goes up, the amount of um, bandwidth required goes down fairly quickly, um, but still doesn't get as low as silent OT. Um, and here's like some performance results, so now seconds for OT. Um, as you can see that there's a, there's a pretty significant improvement over IKMP and also over silent OT's versions other than silver, uh, except for silver in the WAN settings is more efficient. Uh, the slow, no, not kind of, the slow communication becomes a bottleneck still. All right, so how does a soft spoken OT work? Uh, well, I can, a little overview of the, so recall the random oblivious transfer looked like this. You, these are the base OTs uh, for IKMP. For soft spoken OT, it's instead um, uh, all but one OT, I'm calling it. So that means that the uh, receiver selects which bit to not, uh, which message to not receive. Uh, for just two messages, it's the same thing, like glass half empty, half full, what's the difference? But that allows uh, generalization to many messages where the, uh, so there's two to the K different messages where the, and the receiver learns all but one of them. And this is what the base OT is used for um, soft spoken OT. Um, the, uh, they generate some, internally inside OT extensions, they generate some correlations mm -hmm. called oblivious linear evaluation. The idea is that the sender and receiver have U and delta and they learn secret shares, meaning two random values whose difference is some, difference is some value of the product. So uh, that's OLE. We actually need something called subspace vol that's um, uh, basically that, except for, for an um, outer product here. Um, the, uh, so how IKMP works, there's these base OTs. They each become um, single bit voles. It turns out you can just do a little bit of XORing and it becomes the same thing. Um, and then there's a process called derandomization where the, um, the val that input value U, you, it needs to be the same across all these voles so that they can be stacked together side by side into a um, subspace vol. Uh, and so in order to do that, you need to control the U. So what, you, what the sender does is the sender sends a bit saying, um, whether to change, they want to change the input or not, and they can recompute a new vol based on that. So that becomes one bit of communication for each vol. Anyway, so after putting it together, the, it turns out you can hash each row of this um, outer product in order to get more output OTs. So this de-randomization step is the only step that actually requires any significant communication. Um, and it requires, since there's lambda of these voles, each of them you need one bit to de-randomize, it requires lambda bits for OT, so 128 bits. So soft spoken OT, um, I found a new uh, way of doing this um, XORing thing that's based on this all but one OT that can directly give a subspace vol. However, it's, it's only a two to the k subspace vol. So I can stack together two uh, lambda by k of these um, to get a subspace vol, and because I only need to stack together um, lambda by k of them, I only need to de-randomize lambda by k bits, and so it's now k times more efficient. Also um, found some, uh, uh, so there's a, also there's malicious security that um, it's like whether or not you allow uh, an adversary to lie. For malicious security of these sorts of protocols, you need to do some consistency check to catch lies. Um, I found some um, vulnerabilities and like, or just flaws in the proofs of some of the existing consistency checks. Um, finally, there's uh, the base OTs. So the, we came up with uh, a new um, uh, OT, uh, pro, OT protocol that's fairly simple and efficient. And then for doing a, a batch of 128 of them, you can reuse some of the computation in between, between them. But the, the naive way of doing that, like a naive batching we call it, it kept, popped up in a bunch of like libraries and papers, but it turns out to be insecure. Um, so we found a, we, a simple patch for it and used that for um, uh, batching POPF OTs. So you can, uh, we've implemented it, you can see that it's like you know, marginally more efficient than the previous protocols for this. Um, except for there's the simplest in our pincasts there, they only satisfy a weaker security property. 
So finally, I'd like to give thanks to um, everybody who has helped like, me succeed in uh, graduate my graduate studies. So my advisor, of course, Mike Rosalick, and the, the other uh, students in the OSU crypto group. Um, Elliot Slaughter, my practicum advisor. Um, I worked with him to do some uh, on improving a uh, regent, which is a, a um, domain-specific um, language for high-performance computing. And uh, finally, of course, the Krell Institute and the DOEC SDF. Um, it's been uh, a real privilege to be a part of this program. Thank you. <laughs>